Are you guys ready to get into the Word? Amen. Acts chapter 13, if you need a Bible to follow along. You can raise your hands. We're going to look at verses 42 through 52 this morning. Acts chapter 13. You know, something that struck me this week and I wanted to bring out as the theme of, of this message this morning is the truth. And as we walk through this life, there are values appointed to many different things we interact with. And for the believer in God, it seems the truth gains importance as we grow in our understanding of God. The governor, Pontius Pilate, asked Jesus, what is truth? During this mock trial of Jesus that everyone knew was a sham, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, asked Jesus this question, but did not wait for Jesus to answer him before he pronounced a convenient judgment that seemed to absolve the problem he had with the Jewish religious rulers and Jesus. But because he did not wait nor want to know the answer to that ultimate question between God and man, his problems would now become much greater than he could know at that time. And the same is true for any human being that won't rationally deal with the core issue of truth in this world. Now as we follow Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts on their first missionary journey, we see that they declare the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone that will listen. Maybe those struggling with the issue of truth in their own lives during that time of which Jesus we know is the only answer. And as this mission team headed into the interior of modern-day Turkey to Antioch of Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas went to the local Jewish synagogue to declare the truth of Jesus because Paul would be recognized from this rabbinical school and asked to speak there. He took that opportunity to share with them how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies in the Jewish scriptures and that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God that came to save mankind from their sins. Now we know anyone could claim to be the Messiah, but only Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies which Paul declared to the Jews and non-Jewish people that were gathered at the synagogue meeting that Sunday. And in verses 16 through 41, we hear Paul's sermon to those people rehearsing the history of Israel as the foundation for the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled through verifiable historical eyewitness accounts. And then citing the eyewitnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus was crucified on a cross. He died. He was placed in a tomb. And three days later, he rose from the dead to declare God's victory over sin and death. And he appeared to his followers. And then admonishing or warning those that heard as we close this last section from the prophet Habakkuk. If you reject this message that declares and proves this Jesus is from God, there is a price to pay, which brings forth a truth that God requires mankind to respond to themselves, to the truth that they hear, which we will see today in our study. And we pick this up in verse 42 of Acts chapter 13 this morning, speaking of after Paul delivered his sermon to them, as we are told by Luke who recorded these things for us. So 
when the Jews went out of the synagogue in verse 42, <clears throat> the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So the, the Jewish people hear this message and the people that had gathered at the synagogue, the non-Jews or the Gentile people that had come to hear the word of God because they lived in this pagan world system, the Greek pantheon, all of the, the gods of the, the Greek mythologies and, and they, they were capricious and, and cruel, evil, and they could see the truth of what following this did to their society and culture. A cursory study of the Roman Empire will tell you that great empire defeated itself, much like America. It's happening today, being destroyed from within because of the lack of morality, the lack of an ethical foundation that has its base in the belief in God, Almighty God. It'll destroy any nation, and it has, from the Greeks to the Romans to the European empires, and now today. So as they leave the synagogue, the non-Jews or the Gentiles urged Paul and Barnabas to come back the next Saturday and preach the same message to them. Presumably because of how astounding the message of the gospel would be to them. As the message they heard from the Jews was that to be righteous in the sight of God, one must keep all these rules, keep the law of Moses. And to a, a non-Jewish person, I assume that would be somewhat overwhelming, to say the least. Even to a non-Jew that would proselyte into the Jewish religion by being circumcised and following the law, coming to the synagogue, um, try to to go to Jerusalem to attend the yearly feast and then trying to keep all of the other rules that came out of the law of Moses. There was 633 of them. I can barely remember to floss my teeth. <laughs> so we, we can understand how they would be excited to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the, the law of the Jews says, do, do, do. But the law of Jesus Christ says it is done. It is accomplished. It is fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law of God for us at the cross. If we choose to put our trust in that message of the truth. So many of the Jews and devout proselytes or those that joined the Jewish faith followed Paul and Barnabas that day and the message that Paul spoke to them was very clear. Since they believed in the message of the gospel to now just continue in the grace of God. Or, or you could say continue by the grace of of God. This is how you do it. This is how you follow Jesus. Continue in the grace of God. The grace that was given to you from that cross through God's mercy. You now walk in that grace. What a simple instruction. You mean there's not 633 rules? There's not even 42 rules? There's not even 10 commandments? No, here's the command to continue in the grace of God. And we, we know this word grace means unearned, unmerited favor that you can't do anything to earn this grace of God. You just have to accept it in humility with thankfulness because of the truth of the gospel. 
As one modern church acronym puts it, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. The beauty of the concept of grace. That my sin debt to God or my righteousness was paid by God because I could never pay that price. It's grace. And the idea of grace implies that one must accept it, as I said, as a gift with humility and thanksgiving if that person understands the reality of what God gives to the indebted person to righteousness. Indebted before the holy, righteous creator of the universe. Grace. Amazing grace. And how sweet the sound. It is the only way people can know the salvation of God. Just as the scripture declares, we are saved by grace through faith. And even the faith we have is a gift of God so that no human can boast in the presence of God. And that's a good thing. Because if we could boast by keeping certain religious standards, I think we would. Um, which would dishonor the loving grace that God extends to us. Even polluting it, if you will. And that's why it's so important to hold fast to the tenant, the ordinance of God's grace in salvation. And if mankind tries to add anything to God's grace, then that grace is polluted by the work of sinful man, which dishonors God in his mercy, extending that pure grace to us through the mercy he grants to sinners. We must take care to, to protect and to hold to this thing called grace and not to add anything of man to it like many unbiblical religions do in the world today. As any ism we encounter other than the true gospel of Jesus Christ is heretical in its nature, demanding that God accept the work of man in the light of the pure work of God from the cross. And it's not going to fly with God. He will not accept it. And that's why we warn the folks with the LDS movement, the folks with the Jehovah's Witness movements, and the folks with Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and all these other religions because Jesus said he was the only way, the only truth, and the only light. He said he was the only way for man to be saved. And Jesus was emphatic in that statement. And it wasn't to be narrow or arrogant, but to be truthful. The truth of the gospel. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because that's God the Son. That's the holy blood of the Son of God that was shed that day on the cross that God imputes to the soul of the person that will cry out for God's mercy. That blood is just as viable today as it was then and forever. The blood of Jesus. There's, a, there's a, a quote that came out of a couple of commentaries that I put together. It tells us that love can never be offered at the expense of truth. And truth is the real expression of authentic love. This is important in this day and age. This is so important. Well, I know God loves me, and even though I'm living a life that the Bible says I won't inherit the kingdom of God, I know that God loves me, 
And this is the response that you hear. And we, we must know and be able to tell people, God loves you so much. He told you the truth. And you have to know the truth that that's not what you are. That's sin. And God came to set us free, not to be good little Christians, but so that we could be free. And we could be a light in this dark world. And that's the truth that saves. That's the truth that turns us to the only truth of God. As those new believers there now would just continue in the grace of God. And I love this concept. The Holy Spirit now would work in these new believers exponentially or as they experienced life and in their personal interactions through the Holy Spirit leading them to a greater truth in God that's presented through the cross of Jesus Christ. No rules. Just the truth of Jesus and the work of grace in a person's life. But if a believer allows the grace in them to be corrupted by following certain personal religious rules and ideas to set their own standard to be right with God. Here's how it sounds. Well, I go to church. Well, I read my Bible. Or, I like this one, I give money to the church. I go, well, that sounds like a religious standard that, that qualifies yourself, that you're saying, this is my standard. Where is the cross of Christ in all of that when he says, come and die? Where is the truth of the cross in your life? It, this isn't about what you do. This is about what he did. And we must keep our focus on that in order for this grace not to be corrupted or polluted in us. This miraculous power of grace, of the grace of God in us can diminish in a Christian's life. As the grace of God working in us naturally leads a person to a more godly life in Christ. But the lack of grace in a Christian's life leads them into a rule-keeping place with God. A polluted place of grace that is a slippery slope and it's so subtle and subversive that I think it's dangerous. Possibly one of the most dangerous things Christians face today is to no longer be in the grace of God. We need this grace working in us and through us 24-7 in order to grow in Christ, to grow spiritually in the love of God, mainly because of our sinful nature before Christ that is still with us. And it wants to make its own set of standards and rules. And, and it's like, well, I'll do this, but I won't do that. And, and when you find your place, yourself in that place, it's because that grace isn't flowing in your life. And you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. So we must diligently guard our hearts to remain and continue in this grace that Paul later would write to the churches in this Galatian area through the book of Galatians and admonish them by asking them why. What had become or what had begun in grace was now being done through religious rules. Why? This all began in grace in your life and now you've evolved into a place of works before God. Mainly we know from the history of the, the early church because of the Judaizers that Paul, which Paul called them. They would come into a church and they would lay Jewish religious rules on them to add to the work of the cross. Like you should be gathering on Saturday. The Sabbath. The Jewish Sabbath. Why? Well because Jesus was Jewish. 
but what if I want to worship the Lord every day? And they have no answer for that one because they're not in a place of grace. Grace makes me want to worship Jesus every day, every moment in every place in my life. So if you struggle with these things, because we all have a tendency to add our own religious things because of our fallen nature. And if you struggle with the concept of grace, we recommend a book called Why Grace Changes Everything by Pastor Chuck Smith, the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement. It's available on Amazon. Um, in bookstores, we have it here in our lending library. I read this book as a fairly new Christian coming out of a fairly legalistic denomination and boy did it change my relationship with God. It, it caused me to embrace Him on my worst day and on my best day because it was all about His grace and not about what I did right or wrong. It, it revolutionized my, my, my understanding of grace and maybe you need that as well because Christian religionism is a bane to the grace of God. Trust me on that one. So in verse 44, as we continue on the next Sabbath or next Saturday, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Verse 46 <clears throat> then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Can you imagine? The next Saturday, almost the whole city comes to the synagogue to hear the word of God. And this wasn't a small city. And the word of God here in the context refers to the preaching of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus as the Messiah. The Messiah that came to save the world, including the non-Jews from the judgment of God for their sins. Man, what an awesome time. Multitudes coming to hear the gospel. Every preacher's dream. Every Christian's dream that we're going to go preach the gospel in this place and, and we need to, to rent porta potties and, and dumpsters because multitudes will come. Well, it doesn't happen in this day and age very often. But this summer in Phoenix, Arizona, Harvest America with Greg Laurie will be there. That stadium will be filled with 68,000 people to hear the gospel simulcast here at Calvary Payson and all over the world people hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and we need to be in prayer for people around us that we know are not born again I got to talk to somebody this morning that came early and I could sense by the spirit they weren't born again so I asked them about their religious background and said I can sense that you don't know the truth of the gospel in the grace of God and you need to be born again and be set free from all the worries that you have in life that's what the grace of God does setting us free and it was a, a wonderful time and hopefully I get to talk to them again. So as the whole city comes out, the multitudes, to hear the gospel, we see that the Jews become envious. Not because what Paul taught was unbiblical or didn't line up with their scriptures, but because of envy. This envy deep thing called envy. 
And we presume it was because the Jews knew they were the chosen people. Now that would mess you up. <laughs> but when we understand we are also chosen before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus to know the gospel of Jesus, that can mess you up too. But the grace of God fixes it all. The grace of God levels it out for us in all these places and they were only envious because they did not know the grace of God. And also, as I said, they knew they were the chosen people of God to bring forth the Messiah. They were the purebreds, if you will. And now, anyone can get in. Anyone can be accepted by God and forgiven and completely justified by believing in Jesus, which we looked at last study. And I think we can even see these types of things in the church today. As many of us came out of a dreadfully sinful life, and, and we came to Christ, and man, we were overjoyed. You know, we we're forgiven and justified before God. Yet the religionists, those that kept the religious rules, were indignant with many of us. Almost like the older brother of the prodigal son that Jesus told us about in the Gospel of Luke. You mean we've followed all the rules? We've, we've kept out of grievous sin? And you, you squander your life as a criminal? And now you come here and you can just believe in Jesus and everything is supposed to be okay? And we're like, yes. <laughs> it's the Gospel of Grace. It's the gospel of grace. The gospel that Jesus makes us brand new. And the joy. The joy. So we must never become a religionist. And when some dreadful sinner comes out of that dark life, we must embrace them with the grace of God. Welcome to God's family. We're so glad you're here. We must never become bitter or envious. The grace of God will prevent that in our lives. And if envy and bitterness starts to affect your life, remember the word grace. Let me tell you, pastors go through this all the time. Yeah, you drive by that, that church that's just booming down the street, you know, lots of people there, and man, you're like, oh, man. So I learned at a pastor's conference years ago, when that happens to you, pastor, you pray for them. You pray God blesses them. You pray that they would know Jesus in such a powerful way and that the grace of God would flow there, and I still do that today. I don't know what it is about this thing called envy. It's a part of that old nature that I don't fully understand. Why would I be envious? I don't know, but I am. <laughs> Watch yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, they say. <clears throat> and pray God's blessing on en anyone that you may feel envious of in life. And as the Jewish leaders there become, it says, <clears throat> envious, it reminds me of the Jewish leaders at the time of Jesus when the Roman governor knew that they had arrested Jesus because they were envious according to the Gospel of Matthew. And now we're vehemently opposing the message, or you can say the truth, of the gospel, the message of truth, the life and the way, the message of grace. And as we realize, the influence behind that opposition was demonic, just as it was during the time of Jesus, and their actions are the fruit of that demonic influence. They were blaspheming. They were opposing, standing against the truth. That is the fruit of satanic influence in someone's life. Even though everything Paul said to them lined up completely with the scriptures and they knew it, just like at the time of Jesus. 
as Paul responded that it was necessary to bring the gospel to the Jews first as Jesus had said in the gospels but since you reject the truth of Jesus you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life through Christ what an interesting concept we judge ourselves when we reject the truth we're judging ourselves because we're the judge of truth God has given us that moral compass inside of us according to Romans chapter 2 verse 14 we know it's the truth when we hear it and yet so many times we can resist that truth they knew it was the truth all of this implies a responsibility to a human being that God has made um, capable of responding to the truth you can't judge someone for something they're not capable of responding to to so we now see a responsibility to respond to the truth from the scriptures in the book of Acts Paul declares to them you have rejected the truth we will take the message to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people around you just as the scripture declares and that's from Isaiah 49 verse 6 that I will send you as a light to the Gentiles and note, notice Paul says it was the Lord that commanded this bringing this idea that and this understanding that Jesus is the Word of God that became flesh John chapter 1 verse 1 that Jesus has always been in creation as the Word of God that Jesus spoke this through the prophet almost 800 years before Christ and now through the New Testament which we have today it's the Word of God that brings people to the truth the light the light and the truth are always synonymous they always equal each other in the context of biblical conversation the light of God for the salvation of the nations the whole world just as Jesus had declared to his disciples in the gospel records and specifically to the Jewish people that God had chose to be a light to this world around them and even though the Jewish people failed as a whole to keep this light the m truth of the Messiah the Messiah still came forth from the Jews as Jesus said salvation is of the Jews so when the Gentile people heard this in verse 48 they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit so in the non-Jewish people there heard Paul declare the simple truth of the gospel they were so glad and they glorified not Paul but the word of the Lord speaking of verse 47 that God wanted to save all people and even though God used the Jewish people to reveal himself to and establish a moral ethical foundation for the truth through the law of Moses it all pointed to the Savior of Jesus Christ the Savior that would deliver us lawbreakers the law was never given for man to become righteous but to show us a need for a Savior and then notice verse 48 as many as had been appointed to eternal life by God believed which is an interesting statement established by the Holy Spirit in the text here that points to doctrinal truth 
in the Bible, the truth of God, the truth of man, the truth that God is sovereign, acknowledging almighty sovereign God, but yet shows that God honors man in creating man with a self-determinate nature with knowledge. And it's called free will. As the text declares, the believers were appointed or predestined by or even elected by God to believe. Yet, in the whole concept of believing, which points to man's choice. As theologians over the centuries gather in these opposite camps over the issue of salvation. Some say it's all about the predestination or being appointed or chosen by God. Others say that man's response is key to salvation and just simple observation of the Word of God reveals truth. We see here that they're both in place neither den denying the sovereignty of God or denying the free will of man, which is so important. Whenever you get to a place in understanding God or theology where you have to deny something that the Bible clearly teaches, you're wrong. Even if you can't understand it, the Bible clearly teaches the sovereignty, the omniscient, all-knowing God and clearly teaches the free will of man. It teaches both and you actually see both in this scripture. Interesting. Just a cursory study of, of uh, people that are in the predestination camp. This is the scripture they use as their proof text. You see, we're right. And I'm going, I like, think you left out the part that says believed. That implies that those human beings had to make a choice to respond to the truth. And these are good scholars, PhDs. Why did they leave the last part out? It's because of their indoctrination into that theological view. Same way with those that it's all about the responsibility of man. They leave out the sovereignty of God. So whenever you have to deny something that the Bible clearly teaches, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Take a step back, begin to pray. And, and it, it's just so amazing to me that that's their proof text. When I see that word believed, it means they had to make a choice to believe. That's how bad that can get. So the text declares that they were appointed, yet they had to believe. We see both the sovereignty of God in salvation and the responsibility of man to choose to believe, which I think is easier to grasp when we understand Almighty God is omniscient, which means God knows all things past, present, and future. God cannot learn anything. And from Romans chapter 8, verse 29, which is a parallel verse for you Bible students, Romans 8, 29, we see that this appointment in this text, or this predestination, is based on God's foreknowledge of a person's choice to, to make about Jesus, to the truth of the gospel. The truth of Jesus, which still allows for the responsibility the, in man's choice in dealing with their own sinfulness and their own hopelessness for eternal life and yet allowing God to be sovereign God. It works. They were appointed by God but still had to choose to believe or trust in the gospel of Christ. And I'm certain the Holy Spirit worded it like this, even from the Greek, to specifically point these issues out, even though some of the best well-meaning theologians could mess it up. And I think man can mess up anything when they try to think that they're smarter than God and take a text and twist it and deny something in that text. It's important for us, and I think God kind of has a sense of humor. 
Because he lets just plain, simple folks that study the Bible see that truth. But folks that have the education and stuff can't see it. And it has to bring a chuckle to God. <laughs> you think? We see the word of God here was being spread throughout the region by the people that heard and understood and experienced the grace of God being born again by the Holy Spirit by believing. But the opposition rose up immediately, which is normal in a sense, because Satan is continually working through the lives of people to stop the work of the gospel. How does he do it? First thing we see is through their envy. <clears throat> they were jealous. And, and I don't know all the details, but they were envious of these, these non-Jewish people being seen as the same as Jews. We're just as good as the Jews. And man, the Jews didn't like it. It was envy. Envy is a negative human emotion. It's a feeling. Have you ever had it? I've had it. And, and it's a mystery to me. As I said, I wonder, why would I be envious? What's going on inside me? And whatever it is, I don't like it. That's bad juju. <laughs> it's just not right. It's envy. And so we realize it's in us. We recognize it and we combat it through the grace of God. Praying for whoever you're envious of or whatever situation or clearing house sweepstakes or whatever it may be, you begin to pray God's blessings into those places and thanking God that you're just as good as the Jews. You're just, you, that you are justified and forgiven in the sight of God today. And if you're as sinful as I am, you're going to be rejoicing for that forever. Amen? In this place, Satan begins to work through the envy of the Jews. And notice, <clears throat> they stir up some of the prominent women in the synagogue. Oh man, they got the women in the synagogue coming up. Bang! <laughs> just a joke. So, the prominent women in the synagogue, most scholars believe were women that saw the, the mythology of the Greco-Roman world, and as I mentioned earlier, how yucky it really was. Women are a little more sensitive to the yucky factor in societies, and they saw that the Jews worshipped this one true living God. They looked at the law and said, it's good. That brings moral ethics to a society. So many of them would join the synagogue and then as the Jews stirred them up, they went to the leaders in the area of the city of Antioch of Pisidia and they brought persecution against Paul and Silas and then expelled them out of the city. But instead of quitting or being totally discouraged over this. I mean, can you imagine? God, did you see how many people were here? Man, thousands of people are coming to Christ and now these guys are going to stop the work of God. Wrong. They're not going to stop the work of God. And many times persecution actually spreads the work of God and makes the work of God more solid more powerful. So they just shake it off. They shake the dust of the city off their shoes. As Jesus said, when you share the gospel in one place and they reject it, you shake the dust off your shoes. It was kind of a, a, a phrase or a euphemism. You know, then just shake it off and move on. And that's exactly what they do. This is very interesting. I think we can be discouraged at times in the, the way things go in life. Um, even as a Christian, you know, we talk to people about Jesus and, you know, many people mock us and make fun of us and we just feel so isolated and yet we need to learn to shake it off like Paul and Barnabas because of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, tying this whole message back in to the introduction the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It has to be the central truth of our life and not just some peripheral thing. Not just something that we've added to our life, but it's the truth of our life. And this is, will en enable you to shake it off when things happen in life to you. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is so much bigger than our personal happiness. This is a big one. The world out there today tells you, you need to be happy. You need to make yourself happy. But the truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you allow that to be the truth of the center of your life, it will keep you from so many places that you'll regret later. The truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is bigger than my personal fulfillment in life. And I need to remember that. And I need to keep my focus on Jesus and keep moving forward through life with my focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ during those difficult times and learn to shake it off like Paul and Barnabas and moving on in life with the gospel. Not just moving on with my life, but moving on with the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we are told the disciples or those that accepted the truth of Jesus were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. That's how they left them there. Filled with joy and the Holy Spirit and continuing in the grace of God. And that, that's the result of truly believing or trusting by faith in the truth of the gospel. So we may have to remind ourselves that truth when we start getting bent out of shape in life. And what's the shape we're supposed to be in? The shape of Jesus. And we can get bent out of shape pretty quickly in this life. And we need to re remind ourselves, man, I have it good. I've been justified and forgiven through the grace of God that I could never earn. And I need to remind myself of the gospel for my personal life. Shake it off and move on. Even as Paul and Barnabas had to move to the area of Iconium, it's about 150 miles to the east, we will see that a church was established there in that area that Paul would visit again. The gospel of Jesus would spread throughout the region, and it's because the gospel is good news. And even if people reject the truth of the gospel, inside they know it's the truth. So we keep sharing the truth of the gospel and the truth of grace in their lives. And it's the only truth that can bring joy to the soul of mankind, which is so much farther beyond happiness. A deep joy that, yes, right now I'm suffering and I'm hurting pretty deeply, but I have the joy of the Lord, which is my strength, because He's coming He's coming one way or the other and he's coming for me because I've been saved by the gospel of grace. And that's when you know how real it is to be a Christian. The joy that comes from the Holy Spirit teaching us. Has the Holy Spirit ever taught you anything? And you're looking at it thinking, wow, that's the God of the universe that just taught me something here. That is, brings joy to our hearts and our minds. And, and he leads us in this path of righteousness for his name's sake. And it's not to be saved. It's because we are saved, right? And as we've heard the word of the Lord this morning, we need to evaluate how we've responded to the things we've heard. Because in our text this morning, there were three different groups of people. They heard the same message and they responded in different ways. The first group was glad to hear it and said, we want to hear more. The second group followed Paul and Barnabas and they were exhorted into grace. But there was another group. They were envious. They had their own set of righteousness, their own set of standards, religiously speaking. And they walked away from the gospel of Jesus. We often will respond in three different ways when we hear the word of the Lord. And we need to evaluate why we're responding the way we are. Do we want to contend with the message that was given? 
or heaven forbid the messenger that gave the message it's something to think about every time we gather to hear the word of the Lord amen I want to ask the music ministers to come and we'll prepare to close and uh, I want to challenge you if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit with the with the joy of the Holy Spirit this morning ask Jesus why he'll show you your focus is on something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ he loves you and he will show you if you will just pray and seek him I like to pray over things and then revisit it in prayer so I I keep prayer journals because I can't remember stuff and and I'll look at my my prayer lists and I'll go back and pray over it again and say oh yeah yeah Lord you know about this I'm okay going back and and saying you know Lord why am I so bent out of shape is it because of my envy is it because of my sinfulness God my lack of humility and I can imagine the Lord looking at me like Pastor Isaac well <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to walk in the grace of God it really is no more rules just the love of God working in our lives leading us to truth day after day seeing the wonderful love of God in even the small things in life that's what he wants for you let's all stand together if there's anyone here that's never given their heart to Jesus right now they can say Jesus I want to believe in you I know that I have no hope of ever getting out of this alive I want to give you my life today and if that's your prayer he's hearing you he's drawing you in through his grace it's just the opposite of religion He's drawing you to that truth he wants you to join that heavenly song to sing of his love forever and if you need prayer today we'll have men and women up front to pray with you after the service we can hang out here for a long time and and just enjoy fellowship and just just revel in the word of the Lord together if you need prayer you can come forward at any time let's bring him our hearts Over the mountains and the sea your river runs with love for me and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in yes Lord Sing it to him, sing it to him today. Sing it out. love exceeding all things of virtue in this life we're so happy to be in the truth Lord and that song came out in the, the 80s or the, or the 90s and I, I remember thinking man I'm so happy to be in the truth I have the truth of God in my life God bring that joy to us today let us think about the things that we've heard let us put our trust in you because of your great love for us. That's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Give him praise this morning. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome day in the Lord. Amen.